It is important to note that there is still about $900 million of the $13 billion defense budget being spent on new equipment. And occasionally, emergency monies become available. For instance, in October of 2003, in reaction to the two soldiers being killed in their 20-year-old Iltis jeeps in Afghanistan, the defense minister promised $600 million for 66 new armored vehicles called strikers. Today, we are taking an important step in accelerating the transformation of the army. If the money actually comes through in future years, which is not always the case, the earliest the military will have the first 10 of the strikers is 2006. There's no question that we are spending capital uh, money. I mean, with about $900 million a year, maybe an extra $100 million, there's a billion dollars a year, and that is going into the purchase of new platforms. And indeed, whenever there is a peacekeeping operation and the Americans or somebody else wants Canadian participation, number one on the priority list is getting a hold of the Canadian Coyotes. So yeah, some stuff is being replaced, but $100 million is nowhere near the amount of money that is required. Of all three branches of the military, the Navy's equipment is probably faring the best so far. But trouble sits on its horizon as well. The Navy right now is in not bad shape. Uh, the Navy has just, got, uh, has just finished two years of uh, sustained effective operations in the Arabian Sea prosecuting the war against terror. Load. There aren't many navies in the world that can sustain operations like that for a full two years at the distance away from home that ours has. However, our Navy had problems doing that. We could not sustain a destroyer, a command and control destroyer for the entire period. The destroyers were built in uh, the early 1970s, so they are now 30 years old. That's a long time for the hull, and you can only fix that for so long. A bigger problem is the replenishment ships, the tankers, the oilers. Those ships were built in the late 60s, so those ships are 35 years old now. It's taking an immense effort for the Navy to keep them going. Uh, both those ships have had to go into refit uh, within the last two years, uh, which is part of the reason why they were not available to go back to the Gulf a second time. Canada's Air Force is also in critical need of upgrade. From the popular but antiquated Snowbirds, to the CF-18s, to the Sea King helicopters, all the way to our Hercules transport planes, of which 19 of 32 planes are 40 years old, while the other 13 are nearly 30 years old, it is clear the Air Force is on the ropes. We are seeing the Herc fleet with 60% of the Herc fleet, the old Hercs, at the end of their service lives and people saying, oh my God, we're now looking at the number of flying hours. We had so many flying hours in 1990, we're down now to 46% of the flying hours that we had then. And this, of course, has an impact upon your ability to amount any operation because that Hercules medium airlifter is the bread and butter logistics airplane of the Canadian forces. Now, the Hercules fleet, 32 airplanes, 19 of them are the highest mileage Hercs in the world. The problem is that an airplane that old consumes an enormous amount of maintenance, and it has to then spend more and more of the time on the ground being fixed. That time in the shop is going to cost you about six or seven times the amount that you would pay on its first trip into maintenance. An equally daunting challenge facing our forces is the astonishing speed in which technology is changing. Our CF-18 pilots were limited by the effects of out-of-date technology when they were called upon to join the bombing of the Serbian army during the Kosovo War campaign in 1999. The F-18 is a wonderful aircraft in terms of its capabilities and the way it was designed. It uh, hasn't been updated by the Canadian forces in uh, the 14 or 15 years we've had it operationally, and it's still very much a capable frontline fighter. It doesn't mean, however, that it's not technologically very much in need of an update. To make an analogy to personal computers, the F-18 has two mission computers that control its flight and its application of weapons. And 
Those two mission computers have 128K of memory each, which is far less than uh, most people have in their pocket organizers. Our air task force, Mr. Speaker, is well equipped, it's well prepared, our people have been well trained for the role that they are taking on right now. Our radios were subject to jamming, just noise jamming or broadcast jamming or more often uh, really bad Serbo-Croatian music is what they would uh, pipe over the airways and we have no way to defend ourselves against that and obviously radios are vital to communications. On the 21st century battlefield, the inability to react to the high-tech revolution in military affairs continues to put Canadian soldiers at risk. You're getting to the point now where you have the ability to have in an individual vehicle the computer screen in front of, of the driver or the operator, which will show you on that screen a map and the location of all of the other vehicles that are part of what's called the Blue Force, so the guys on our side. The sort of technology that if it had been in place in Afghanistan so that the American pilots have been able to put on a screen and say, aha, that firing coming from down there comes from a little blue dot, so we don't, are not going to bomb it. If we'd had that then, then we would have had guys that would be still be alive today. You can't survive in the world that they're being asked to live in with simple spears and enthusiasm when the other guy has hot, capable, modern equipment. The reality is that the defense issue in Canada boils down to how much you're prepared to spend on the capital equipment. You can have just as much defense as you're prepared to pay for. Everything else is make-believe. It's words written water and they'll disappear in the hard light of day quicker than dew.